Hey everyone, and in this video we're going to look at how to improve writing by using portfolios. Before we get started, I just wanted to do a quick recap with you about some of the best strategies for improving writing in general. So the first one is to get them to write frequently. Rather than doing one big long text once a month or once a semester, get them to write short texts nearly every day as possible. We're also going to take those um, short texts and, and look at them as teachers and say, what's working well? What could be improved? What are some of the general patterns in class that the students are doing? And then we're going to target our teaching to improve problem areas or even growth areas. What are some of the places where a lot of students are making mistakes? What are some places where we could help students enrich their writing and make it even better? If you focus your teaching on exactly where they're at, by using diagnostics, you're going to find that they improve a lot faster. Okay, so keeping these strategies in mind, there are two kind of structures that we can do that will really help improve the process. So first of all is the writing process, and we know this one. This is um, when students brainstorm, plan, write, revise and edit, polish, and then you evaluate, right? So when you write an essay, you brainstorm ideas, you make a plan, you write your draft, you revise your draft, um, and, and then produce a good draft, and then your teacher evaluates it, which is great. But what we're going to talk about today is portfolios and the portfolio building approach, how that works. So just as a quick overview, the portfolio approach uses four steps. We collect writing, we select the best writing, and polish it, we reflect on the writing, and then we evaluate it. All right, so let's dig in a little bit deeper. What is a portfolio? Well, a portfolio is really a collection of students' works in progress and final drafts that they've created over time. It involves reflection, selection, and the great part about this is that it allows students to demonstrate only their best abilities and efforts when they're being evaluated. So in, instead of evaluating every single piece of work that you get students to write, you collect it, but then only give grades to their best stuff. Right? Reflection is a really important part of this process, and this is where it helps students to become better learners and better writers, because as they go through the portfolio process, they have to think about why they chose the piece that they did, how they're polishing it up, how their writing is improving. They have to prove that to you and think about it. Right? So it really involves selection and reflection, which will help students become better self-regulated learners. The writing portfolio approach is also a work in progress, right? So we're collecting large pieces over time um, rather than one piece and then evaluate it, write a piece and evaluate it. We collect a whole bunch and so these are not perfect. We collect lots of imperfect writing pieces. All right, how do we set portfolios up in the classroom? Well, there are four main steps and each one of them rhymes. So are you ready? First step. Collection! As I mentioned, the first step, we gather lots and lots of small writing samples from the students. So collection. Collect those, those samples. Once we have a lot of samples, we select them. So we have collection and selection. Select your best one piece, or your best three pieces, or your best five pieces, or the most improved you decide. We'll talk about that. Okay, choose what to submit for evaluation. So out of the ten pieces you have, choose your best one or choose your best two, and then you're going to make it even better by correcting it and polishing it through the writing process. Then they're going to reflect. So collection, selection, reflection. Students have to explain why this choice, and they have to reflect on their learning. And finally, delayed evaluation. Collection, selection, reflection, delayed evaluation. It's delayed because the teacher only evaluates the best work. This is a win-win situation. You don't have to grade every single piece, which means you don't get the worst pieces. You only get the best pieces to evaluate. Less grading for you, better grades for them. Okay, quickly. Step one, collection. What 
and how are you going to collect these pieces? When I was teaching in high school, I started writing portfolios using something that looked a lot like this picture here. So I gave my students actual file folders and I allowed them to write their name and color all over it and, you know, post stuff, sticker stuff all over it to make it their own and personalized. I would hand them out at the start of every class and any writing that we did would then get back in their file folder and I'd pick them up at the end. So that's what a physical one would look like. And, you know, this would be part of our daily classroom thing. It could also be a binder or a notebook for the students. So the students could keep their own notebooks and you could have that. Um, another alternative is electronic, of course. You could create file folders or students could create file folders in their um, desktop or laptop and, and have that there as their English folder. If you're doing a physical one, I have found it's important to make it colorful and attractive. Students become a lot more attached and, and, and um, excited about writing when they feel they have some ownership over it. So once you have all this collection happening, whether it's physical or electronic, this is when you start the diagnostic process. And what does that look like? Well, again, you've collected your short, uh, frequent writing samples in the portfolios. My suggestion is aim for, to write one, one thing a day. And you take a look at those samples. So again, are they, <laughs> are they making you know, common spelling errors? Everybody is spelling when <laughs> Um, badly, so maybe we need to look at spelling of common words. Maybe it's capitalizations. Maybe they're all not uh, capitalizing the, the letter I. So what is it that a large number of students really need to focus on? And um, you can teach to the class that way. Teach the targeted structures, or if you get really good at this, you can um, do this indi more individually and say to the students, this is what I want you to focus on for next time. Go find out the rule, figure it out, and then improve. If you're not sure how to get the students um, writing, there's some ideas. This is what I used to love to do with my students. Um, and it's great because it requires zero prep. So it's a really good plan B sometimes. So we would do things called free writing where the kids would just pull out a piece of paper and they would have a set, num set amount of time to write either on a topic or on whatever they wanted to. So 10 minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, you decide. So something like take a piece of paper, write as fast as you can. You have to keep writing. Don't stop. Don't worry about the grammar. Don't criticize yourself. So that was fun. And I got to see what they were capable of when they stopped thinking about um, worrying about grammar and spelling and things. The other thing you can do is give them writing prompts. And again, this is really low prep, but also kind of fun. So things like when it rains, I like to do this. My greatest fear is on the weekend I like to, or you know, those are just general ones, but you could do ones that are associated with your theme. Um, if you're talking about superheroes, um, who's the best superhero of all time? If you could be any superhero, who would you be? Um, who is your nemesis? You know, you decide. Okay, so we've talked about collection. The next step is selection. Selection. So how do we get the students to choose which pieces to submit? So let's say they have a collection of 10 pieces that you've done throughout the, uh, the month or the semester. How do we decide what they're going to hand in? Well, the first thing to figure out is what are your goals for this portfolio? Do you want to see that they've done progression in their writing? Do you want to see that they're learning to write really creatively? Um, are you focusing on developing argumentative skills? Do you want to see a range of their abilities? It doesn't really matter, but as long as you can decide, and you can even consult with the students, you set up criteria. So for things like um, for writing style or purposes, or to, you know, use of a certain technique if they're advanced, um, or as I say, to demonstrate evolution or improvement. It could be anything else, really, as I said things that are creative or funny or um, scary, you know. You decide as long as you have a common goal. I'm going to give you an example here of something that I might have said to my students. So I might have told them in my instructions, choose one piece that shows your best work, one piece that shows the most improvement, and one piece that showcases one of the techniques we've been working on at that time. So I don't know, I used to teach it rich, so figurative language, metaphor, simile, etc etc 
So collection, selection, the next part about uh, in selection is not just choosing, but we're going to polish. So let's say they've now chosen those three pieces. You need to give the students opportunity to polish the work. And this happens through the writing process. So they've selected. They're going to take those three pieces and read through them again carefully and even get a friend or two to read through the pieces and give some feedback about areas that could be improved. They're going to edit for things like grammar and spelling and punctuation and structure. What are things that need to be fixed? So if they've revised and edited, then they can polish. So they have their what they think are their three best pieces um, and then they've polished them up and that's where they're going to submit them. This is also a really great opportunity for peer editing, right? This is not just you revising and helping them edit, but also their peers, checking in with their peers. So I'm gonna do a little sidebar and talk quickly about peer editing do's and don'ts. Do, teach the students how to peer edit. This is like any other skill. Um, they cannot peer edit effectively until you show them how to do it. So don't hand the students um, each other's work and say, hey, sit with your partner and uh, correct each other's work. You won't get very good results. You need to specifically model by taking an example and saying, okay, if I were going to peer edit my friend, I would, you know, start by correcting some of these spelling errors that I make and you show them how to do that. You have it on the whiteboard or the overhead and show them exactly what you're doing. Then we do. So you take a new piece um, and do another together. So, okay, guys, now have a look at this one together as a class. What would you do? What do you see? What do you notice? And you scaffold them through that. And once they have a good sense of that, you get them to sit with their partner and practice together and you circulate and help them out. And they need to do this over a period of time before they get good at it. So don't assume that they know how to peer edit. Finally, you really need to give them tools to help them while they're peer editing. Things like checklists are super important. This, you don't have to use one as complicated as this, but it's just an example. Um, of course, don't ask students to grade their peers' work for obvious reasons, and don't use peer assessment for, you, for your feedback, for your evaluation, sorry, again. All right, so we have collection, selection and polishing, reflection is the next step. So once the students have collected and selected their best work, they've polished it up, you, can, you need to ask them to explain why these choices. Why was this the best? Why was it most improved? Um, why is this the one that demonstrates the best technique? Why, why, why? So they get to really start thinking about their own learning. To start with, you might want to do this orally. So you sit with a student and help them select, so scaffold them through it. They might have a hard time doing it by themselves initially. As they get more practiced, you can do this in writing, so you can give them a set of guiding questions to answer and they can respond to them as they submit their portfolio with the reflection. Yeah, so I wrote give guiding questions. You can think about what these might be, but here are some examples that I found on Edutopia. Things like, how have you gotten better at writing persuasive essays? Or, where do you think you need to improve this piece of poetry? Or, what would you change in this story if you had to do it over again? Um, what are some of the things you've seen in your classmates uh, film scripts that you'd like to try in your next piece, etc, etc. So collection, selection, reflection, the last part is evaluation and it's delayed evaluation. So this is how do we assess portfolios, collection, selection, reflection, delayed evaluations. Remember, it's delayed evaluation because you only grade the final drafts of the one or two or three pieces that the student has chosen. And this is what's super awesome, is that you don't have to correct 10 pieces of writing over the course of a semester for, for all students. In fact, you only correct their one, two or three best pieces of work, which is totally win-win because they get the best grade on their best work and you only have to grade their best work. So again, 
whenever you're evaluating anything, the first thing you need to know to decide is what is it that you're looking for? What are the evaluation criteria? What are the features you're looking for in this competency? Use an evaluation tool, a rubric or a checklist, super important. And make sure that you share your evaluation criteria. It has to be transparent. What are you looking for? Books, correct spelling, writing goals. Make sure that it's transparent for the student. And I would even suggest that you ask the students to use the evaluation tool to self-evaluate. So I used to do this with my students. So I would give them the evaluation rubric and I would say, before you hand your, your portfolio in, make sure it's got your, th your three pieces of writing, your reflection, and that you filled in your own evaluation rubric. And most of them would look through and go, oh, and they would evaluate themselves and they'd realize that they could probably improve a little bit more if they wanted a better grade. So something like this, um, this is an example. It uses a rating scale rather than a rubric, but you get the suggestion. Okay. So that was all about using writing portfolios. So just to recap, there are four stages, collection, selection, reflection, and delayed evaluation. A portfolio is a collection of students' works and final drafts they've created over time. It involves reflection and selection, and it includes, it really the idea here is that they demonstrate their best abilities and efforts. It also incorporates the writing process. So by choosing writing portfolios, you're not putting aside the writing process because the students are selecting and revising and editing and polishing pieces to submit, which is great. And overall, this is a really big win-win situation for both you and the students because they get to write more frequently, which is better for them, um, but you don't have to grade every single piece of writing they hand in. You can just collect it. And then the students will submit only their best work, so they get better grades. You only correct their best work, so you're a lot more efficient in your grading. And the students will learn to reflect on their learning, so everyone wins. Better grades, less work, and better learning. And that's it. Thanks for watching.